This video is sponsored by Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. It's a commonly shared bit of wisdom that investors should look to diversify their holdings to mitigate and reduce their risk exposure. But when it comes to geographic diversification, a lot of people kind of drop the ball. In fact, home country bias, where investors hold a disproportionately large share of their investments in domestic stocks, is a rampant thing in the world of finance. In the US, for example, investors commonly put upwards of 70% of their portfolio into domestic stocks. And even here in Canada, where it's common to allocate at least a portion of your portfolio to US stocks, given the size of our southern neighbor's market, domestic stocks still represent 60% of the average Canadian's equity portfolio. Now, this isn't to say that you can't be a successful investor by focusing within your borders. And there are even some research papers that challenge the diversification benefit provided by investing internationally. But I think a lot of people don't look elsewhere simply because investing internationally is more involved. It comes with new risks and added complexities you don't have to deal with at home. Things like foreign exchange, geopolitical factors, new terms like VIEs and ADRs, which have been in the news a lot lately. So that's why I wanted to make today's video. I'll be going over the steps involved with investing internationally, as well as the risks, considerations, and opportunities you should have a handle on. So let's go over everything you need to know about investing internationally on today's Plain Bagel. Today's video is going to be a bit of a primer for international investing with a few different segments, including why you should consider investing abroad, the risks involved, the step-by-step -step process for doing so, and other practical considerations. I'll also be discussing VIEs and ADRs, as well as other instruments towards the end that all are involved with international stocks. So there's a lot I'll be covering, both for those starting from square one, and some things for people who might have a bit of knowledge but don't know where to go from there. Because of that, this video will be longer than usual, but I will include timestamps in the description below so that you can navigate to the areas that you're interested in. But with all that said, let's kick things off with the why of international investing. There are a few justifications for expanding your horizons, if you will, past your own borders. For one, some businesses and investment opportunities might simply not be available in your home country, which increases the benefit of looking abroad. Countries differ pretty drastically in terms of their competence in different industries. Canada, for example, has a sizable finance sector, but a very small healthcare sector. So a Canadian looking to invest in healthcare companies wouldn't have much of a selection at home. So if you want to properly diversify your exposure to different sectors and businesses, you almost always need to look abroad. Investing in other countries also better diversifies your country risk. The risk of something at the country level going wrong and negatively impacting your portfolio. And of course, there is also the added return potential that comes with investing your money in developing markets. This is a higher risk, higher reward move, but thanks to what's known as the catch-up effect, where less developed countries often see higher growth rates than more developed markets, investors can see higher returns from companies operating in a developing market, given that those markets will likely see a more rapid increase in consumption. Now, some people are totally content investing within their borders, and I'm not suggesting that you have to invest internationally to be successful. There is also something to be said for sticking within your circle of competence. And as mentioned, the diversification benefit has decreased over time thanks to globalization. But most would agree that you only stand to benefit by at the very least considering companies outside your country. If nothing else, they'll give you a better comparison tool for evaluating the businesses you have in your home country. So that's why you might want to consider investing internationally. But of course, this action does come with extra risks as well. You bet your bippy I'm going to highlight everything that could go wrong in this video. Because here at The Plain Bagel, we don't like to get too excited before bringing up all the fine print and everything that could go wrong that will probably keep you up at night. <laughs> now, risk is everywhere, but investing internationally does add a new layer to the dangers you face, especially when you do venture into less developed markets. Developing markets may not be as safe or transparent for investors when it comes to accounting rules, disclosure requirements, and other investor protections. The US, for example, is considered to have some of the highest stock standards in the world. Companies face audits, need to file regular statements, and are upheld to a number of disclosure requirements. But that's not the case everywhere in the world, and some places would surprise you in terms of the few protections they actually have. There's also, of course, all the economic, political, and regulatory baggage that comes with the country. 
China is a perfect example of how this can be a risk for you as the investor. The country has recently been rapidly changing its regulation around tech companies, much to the expense of investors. Risks also exist around the stability of a country's currency, their tax regime, and all the unique rules you might face as the investor. In other words, when you invest internationally, you're at times placing your money into a completely new ecosystem. So it's important to have a good understanding of the markets that you want to invest in before you put your money into them. Even if you find an attractive business from a fundamental standpoint, the risks they face at the country level could be enough to warrant avoiding the position. So that's the risk return trade-off of international investing. There are certainly more opportunities available when you expand your scope, but likewise more risks that you need to be cognizant of. But with all that out of the way, let's get into the how of investing internationally. Buying stocks internationally comes with a few extra steps when compared to investing in domestic stocks. So let's go through a step-by-step -step process for how one actually goes about adding a foreign listed stock to their investment portfolio. The first step for buying a company listed elsewhere is to identify the company's ticker and the exchange it trades on. Generally speaking, public companies list their shares on the exchange of their respective region. UK companies can often be found on the London Stock Exchange, Chinese companies on the Shanghai or Hong Kong exchanges, and Australian companies on the Australian Securities Exchange. If you want to buy a company from a foreign country, you'll need to know where it's trading and how it's identified on that exchange. Now, the main identifier for stocks are their tickers, which is the short alphanumeric code that comes with it. However, ticker conventions do vary between different markets. In Hong Kong, for example, stocks have a numeric ticker, while in the US, they are usually alphabetic. It's also important to note that some tickers represent different companies on different exchanges. The ticker T, for example, represents TELUS in Canada, but AT&T in the US. Oddly enough, both telecom companies. This is why it's important to know where the stock you want is trading. If you aren't careful, you might end up with the US telecom company when trying to buy the Canadian one. You can, however, avoid this issue by using a stock's ISIN identifier, a 12-digit alphanumeric code. This is an international identifier that will be unique to the stock. And while obviously harder to remember and usually not as punchy of a code, it can be used to avoid any sort of mix-up. Once you know the stock you want and where it trades, the next step is to make sure your broker can actually access the exchange in question. Not all brokers are set up to trade on all exchanges. Robinhood, for example, is only set up to buy and sell stocks on US stock exchanges. There are also some countries such as China that don't let foreigners own certain stocks. So if you know where you want to invest, be sure to research if your platform of choice can actually access the area. Now, the third step is to deal with the foreign exchange. Different stock exchanges operate on different currencies. Stocks listed on the London Stock Exchange are quoted in pounds, and stocks listed on the Japanese Stock Exchange are quoted in yen. If you want to buy a foreign stock, you have to do so in the currency of the stock ticker. You can handle this in one of two ways. You can look into dealing with the FX yourself and adding the currency you need to your account before making the trade, something not all brokerage accounts even allow. Or secondly, you can ask your broker to deal with the exchange for you. The second option is certainly more convenient and usually just involves ticking a box before you place your order, but the convenience almost always comes at a cost. So it's worth investigating the rates that you'll get with your broker, as well as any fees you'll face, versus doing it yourself. You can usually get a better exchange rate by doing it yourself and adding the currency to your account. Now, the last step is to submit your order with considerations for the time zone and hours of operation of the exchange you're buying from. Obviously, stock exchanges that operate in different parts of the world will be on different times. So when you can buy a stock will vary by stock exchange. Now, this doesn't mean that you'll have to stay up till 3 a.m. to buy a German company. You can usually leave your order with your broker to complete when they're able to. But it's another consideration in case you were hoping to time your purchase or get a specific price. And that's about it for the how of buying international stocks. But there are a few caveats I want to add as well when it comes to international investing. So let's move on to the considerations for buying a foreign stock. The first point here is that international trading can be costlier than trading domestically. Brokers may charge additional fees on top of the FX for buying and selling in different markets. And there may be additional administrative or market related costs unique to the international market that you are investing in. So as always, it's worth investigating how these costs will impact your return. 
Secondly, as mentioned, you'll need to exchange your money before you make your purchase, but you'll also need to do so when you sell the position. And because exchange rates fluctuate on the daily, the rate you buy and sell the stock at will have a direct impact on the returns you see in your portfolio. For example, let's say you're a Canadian investor who invests $1,000 into a Swedish bagel company, a firm that's listed in Swedish Kroner. When you make the investment, the exchange rate is 6.8. So your $1,000 fetches you 6,800 Kroner. Now let's say the stock ticker increases by 10%. Assuming the Canadian dollar and Swedish Krona exchange rate doesn't change, you will see a 10% return in your portfolio. But if the exchange rate fluctuates, it will modify how much your money actually grows. Now, this volatility can work to your benefit if the Canadian dollar actually depreciates before you sell the stock. But this is all to say that your return in terms of your domestic currency will likely vary from what the foreign stock does in terms of its own price, depending on changes in the exchange rates. Finally, there are the tax considerations. Tax rules obviously vary depending on where you live, where you're investing, and any treaties between the two. And while the whole topic could have its own video, if not its own channel, there is one thing I wanna highlight when it comes to dividends, and that is withholding taxes. Some countries charge a tax on dividends paid out to foreign investors in addition to whatever tax you may pay at home. So clearly that's something you'll need to look into if you're looking to collect foreign dividends. Now, to some degree, this can be avoided through certain investment accounts like tax exempt or tax deferred accounts, but it will depend on the tax rules of your country and where you're investing. In Canada, for example, the RRSP does not incur withholding taxes on US stock dividends, but the TFSA does, even though the account is supposed to be tax exempt. Okay, so that's all the baggage that comes with investing internationally. It's a lot, I know. And in some cases, it could be enough to turn you away from trying to buy a foreign stock. Fortunately, if you are sort of turned off of the idea, there are some workarounds to buying foreign stocks directly that will allow you to avoid some of these complications while still gaining exposure to international businesses. For one, you may notice from time to time that some foreign companies are indeed listed on domestic exchanges. ENB and BABA, for example, are New York Stock Exchange traded tickers for Enbridge, a Canadian company, and Alibaba, a Chinese company. So what's the deal here? Well, for Enbridge, this is an example of a company cross-listing its shares. This simply means that the company has listed their stock both on their domestic exchange, in this case, the Toronto Stock Exchange, and a foreign exchange, meeting all the rules and regulations required for both. This means investors have flexibility to buy the stock in either US or Canadian dollars. BABA, on the other hand, is technically an ADR, or American Depository Receipt. In practice, ADRs are very similar to cross-listing, but they are technically a unique method for listing a foreign stock. You see, ADRs are actually receipts for foreign stock being held in trust. So when you buy BABA, you aren't buying a common share, but rather a certificate for eight shares of the Hong Kong listed ticker 9988, the Hong Kong version of the Alibaba stock. Again, in practice, buying ADRs is the same as buying a cross-listed ticker. But hopefully that clears up why some foreign companies are listed as ADRs, while others are not. They are technically two different things. Outside of buying foreign companies that are listed domestically, you can also gain international exposure by investing in domestic funds that hold foreign positions. There are a multitude of mutual funds and ETFs out there that will invest in foreign stocks and deal with all the complications themselves behind the scenes. And in fact, a number of funds will go as far as to try and hedge the currency risk that's involved with these positions, meaning you can technically avoid the impact of fluctuating exchange rates and how that will affect your performance. Finally, if all that is still not enough to convince you to invest abroad, you can at the very least look into gaining international exposure through domestic tickers. Now I know that sounds a bit counterintuitive, but as you probably know, there are plenty of companies that operate internationally. So you could simply choose to put your money into companies that make their own profits from other parts of the globe. Take a company like Canada Goose, for example, a very Canada brand company that surprisingly earns 81.5% of its revenue from other countries, with Asia actually being its biggest market. So if nothing else, consider where your domestic holdings actually earn their money. You can usually find this information pretty easily in the company's regulatory filings. 
So those are all the ways you can gain international exposure through stocks. But before I sign off, I do want to quickly touch on VIEs or variable interest entities, especially given that I brought up Alibaba. VIEs are something that's been in the news a lot lately, and they've been labeled a higher risk setup for investors when it comes to Chinese positions. In essence, a variable interest entity is a legal business structure where one company has interest, but not shareholder control of another company. This is the case with the ticker BABA. American investors own a company that has a profit sharing agreement with the Chinese Alibaba company, but they don't actually own the Chinese company itself. Now, VIEs are pretty common and completely legal business structure in most countries. And for most international stocks, they aren't really a reason for concern. But with China specifically, there are rules against foreign investors owning Alibaba and similar companies directly. So some are concerned that the Chinese government might crack down on this structure in the future, which is currently standing as a workaround to this rule. Obviously, that's a big unknown for investors today, but it just goes to highlight the point I made earlier that international investing adds a new layer of risk and complexity to your portfolio that you need to be aware of. So tread with caution. But hey, that's about all I have to say about international investing. I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to comment and like if you did, and I'd be interested to hear where you invest geographically and why you think those areas are attractive. Thanks for watching and be safe on your adventures abroad. I've always found that the hardest part of trying out something new for the first time was finding someone to run you through the basics who had experience. It's one of the reasons I made this video since a lot of investors aren't that familiar with international investing. But if you're someone who has a task or skill that you wanna try out and just don't know where to start, you should check out Skillshare, today's sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes to help you learn new skills or perhaps better hone existing ones. They cover everything from the fine arts and animation to entrepreneurship and productivity. I've personally used it a lot for home reno and video making stuff. And just recently I watched YouTube success, script, shoot and edit with MKBHD because I had Marquise Brownlee himself walking me through how he makes a video. And it was really cool and helpful to see. Funny enough, there was actually a finance related takeaway of never giving a number without context. Something I didn't expect, but a pleasant surprise. Anyway, if you join the platform, you get unlimited access to awesome classes like this one and much, much more. Best of all, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below will get a one month trial so you can try it out and start learning today. And with unlimited access and the month being completely free, you can really have at it trying out the content. So check them out, it supports the channel and thank you Skillshare for sponsoring today's video.